let us through the gate, please. We're actually going backstage so we can actually meet the real people of rock and roll. God, please. We don't want to have sex with them. We just want to meet them. Guys like myself feel not that different from my fans because I still love rock and roll. Who rocks, man? They are the band, baby. Woo! The fans are part of the band, and then therefore the band is definitely a part of my life. Each album of the crew has been represented with my tattoos. What I just try to do on stage is help people have a good time. Because that's the reason that the, the fans are there, and that's the reason we're there. I was born there. I think I might have gone, I have a cold head. People can get me wound up, you know, the louder the crowd is, the better I can perform. You know, like adding octane to your gas tank or something. When I auditioned for the Dallas Cowboys Cheerleaders, Motley Crue truly gave me the inner spirit or the energy to make it through the audition. I'm a proud Republican. This is just the type of music that I like, and you can either enjoy it with me or you can get out. <laughs> Some nights, you know, I'm just playing along, and then I'll see all three of them just rocking out, and I'm like, I can't believe it. I'm actually up here with them. We're talking about four outcasts who turned into one of the biggest rock and roll bands in history. Motley Crue represented everything that my mother told me to stay away from, and that's why I love Motley Crue. We don't want Britney Spears. We don't want Backstreet Boys. We want Motley Crue. Having fans is great. I mean, that's what this whole thing is about. Uh, you know, is, is is appealing to people and and having you know trying to get fans. I'm no different than the fans that follow us around the country. You know, when I hear the new ACDC records coming out, I got to be down there and get it. And I rush home and like my hands are kind of sweating as I tear it open and you know I put it in the CD player. And that feeling, I still have that feeling. <laughs> I work as a mainframe system specialist for the number three telecommunications company in the world, Sprint. I make sure that if someone uses their PCS phone or their pager or their fax machine, I have a hand in making sure that their invoice is error free when it hits the house. If y'all don't mind, please make sure that on the migrations form that y'all highlight it, put fluffy stickers around it. I don't care, just let me know. I spread myself awfully thin. I wear a lot of different hats. I'm a student. I'm working on my second master's degree. And I'm a wife. I'm proudly married to Joel, who's the second most loyal Motley Crue fan. And I'm also a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. Sometimes I don't know whether I'm coming or going. My job is very tedious. But I have an outlet, and Motley Crue provides that for me. If it's a bad day, we might be listening to Shout at the Devil. If it's a good day, we might be listening to Dr. Feelgood. The whole CD, round and round, and I just push uh, instant replay, and it just does the whole CD all day long. <laughs> You like Molly Crew, Peter? Uh, not really. I'm more of a classic rock fan. I like the music, but I cannot hear the singing. And I'm about <laughs> two generations behind Motley Crew, I think. Obviously, and I think I'm the only Motley Crew fan out of the group. <laughs> I grew up in Sycamore, Kansas. Large trees and a lot of farmland. I first heard Motley Crue in 1983. It was New Year's Eve, and I was sitting in my friend Victor's apartment with my girlfriend Catherine, and I saw Motley Crue, and I remember thinking, this is the coolest video I've ever seen. Motley Crue's music made me feel strong and powerful and sexy, and whenever I wanted to feel that way, I'd always pop in their CD, and my deep desire to be a blonde. So Vince Neil, of course, was appealing. 
I posted pictures of Vince Neil all over my room and my father kept saying, that girl would be pretty if she wouldn't wear so much makeup. <laughs> I was a cheerleader for one year of high school. However, I did not make cheerleading my senior year. I was like, what in the heck am I gonna do? And I, auditions came up from my local junior college, and it was a full ride scholarship for two years. Girls, Girls, Girls had come out the summer after I graduated. And I remember listening to my Girls, Girls, Girls tape before I went to audition. It's funny how like some of our music affects people. Like we've had a lot of football players would pump up to, to kickstart my heart before they go out on the field. And they use our music for, uh, for things that you just go, wow, that's really cool. Girls, Girls, Girls gave me the strength to make it through the audition and I cheered for my local junior college for two years. auditioned for the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders in 1995. Sitting outside Texas Stadium in 1995, I was listening to my Dr. Feel Good CD, trying to get myself motivated, because looking at the line of a thousand girls wrapped around Texas Stadium, I kept thinking, I'm too short, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not blonde, <laughs> there's my blonde hang up again. And, and literally listening to Motley Crue, if I could stay focused and just keep singing, um, dancing on glass, you know, things of that nature, I was gonna be okay. It truly gave me the inner spirit or the energy to make it through the audition. Cindy's a closet rock fan. Um, she could go through our organization's normal protocol and one would not necessarily know that side of Cindy. I experienced it personally when we took them to Tokyo and our last night of a very grueling promotional tour for the NFL, we took them to one of Tokyo's hot spots and when the ballads were over and the top 40 was over and the headbanging rock and roll came on, Cindy hit the floor and was there for probably five or six songs without even looking up. And she wouldn't dance with anybody, she was just dancing with herself and the, and the, the music. Oh my gosh, I can headbang if you want. Shut up, no! You gotta, you gotta just, this is what you do. <laughs> you gotta get me in the mood here. Wait. <laughs> okay. Oh gosh. That'll make everyone I went to high school with very happy, let me, let me tell you. All right, all right everybody headbang, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> We've never danced to a Motley Crue song as a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. I'm hoping that maybe one of these days we'll do a hard rock medley, and maybe I can slide one of the crew songs in there. I need to stretch a little more. When I first got here in 95, I was so embarrassed of my family and the way I grew up and just how I acted in Motley Crue. I never told anybody about any of that. Now I'm 30 years old and accept me faults and all. Thank God for Motley Crue and the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. Thank God. I'm no longer a redneck. <laughs> and I would do things to him that you would never know. <laughs> we always take time out to, you know, sign as many autographs as we can. If I could sign, you know, 50 million autographs, I would, but I'd probably be a much older man then. <laughs> Sometimes I feel embarrassed to sign autographs because I don't think it's easy for someone to walk up to somebody else and admire them. Are we pathetic? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nerve-wracking for me to meet some of my heroes. There's a disappointment that happens a lot, and I don't want to be one of those people that disappoint the fan. I kind of like try to avoid now signing signing people because like a lot of times they go and just get it tattooed. Then you know when they come back and they go, they show you their tattoo of, of your autograph. It's like, oh. Man. <laughs> when you sign an autograph, you can't look away, you know. You see people do that, that's complete bullshit. You gotta look people in the eye, 
you know, sign it, Thanks. ask them what it is, you know, they like about the band or, you know, do you like the new record? And you make that connection. I think that's a responsibility. If Nikki says, show me your what? I'll take off my pants. It was very exciting when we first started out, especially, you know, with, with the girls, you know, with women. It was like, wow, man, this is, this is easy. You sign the other one? <laughs> the other what? Because they're boobs. <laughs> no, boob. My name is Brian Marriott, I'm 27 and live in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm the political director for the Home Builders Association of Greater Kansas City. I lobby the local governments and the state governments regarding issues that affect the building and development industry. And I'm the political director in Missouri for Bush Cheney 2000. I'm a proud Republican. I have always tried to judge from my own mind what I, what I thought about the issues, and that's how I came to the conclusion that I had a lot of Republican beliefs. I've been a big music fan all my life, and my favorite bands to listen to has been Motley Crue. The music world is an escape for me, and that's one reason I like the band so much, is because they represent everything that is basically against what I do and what I believe in. Right now I'm on my way over to uh, the studios at KQRC to see my buddy Moose from college and join him on his on-air shift and talk a little bit about Motley Crue. Kansas City's rock station is 98.9 The Rock. It is Tool H. Moose with you in the nighttime once again. And my buddy Brian in the house with us tonight, of course. We're discussing Motley Crue. Yes, Motley Crue, the new CD, new tattoo. Excited about the crew. Now, we've hit a lot of shows together, and there's always something strange that happens to us. What do you suppose is going to occur on this tour? I imagine Nicky's going to spit on us again. Uh, you know what? He's the only guy that I would let spit on me again and not kick his ass. I remember when I first started listening to Motley Crue going through high school, you know, I had my long-haired heavy metal days, and I think every one of us, including the band itself, is mature. Our longtime fans are older now, and they bring their kids, and you have the younger fans that have just kind of discovered Motley Crue. So you have it's a very diverse audience. You have some heavy metal guy standing next to a guy in a business suit. I found myself being kind of attracted to the band because of the sound that they have. And I like music that has really kind of a crunch to it, you know, with the guitar and, and, and the heavy beat. What I do for a living doesn't in any way have an effect on what kind of music I listen to. You know, the music industry, and as well as, as politics, is a very aggressive lifestyle. And if you're going to succeed in, in, in either one, you have to be very aggressive and, and know what you want. There are similarities. I mean, there's not the decadence that you see on a wide scale as you might. I mean, we had a president that lived kind of a rock and roll lifestyle, but uh, that's not the party that I represent. I think that the crew's attitude that they have, that that they're very driven, and that's how I live my life, you know. Michael, hi, this is Brian Marriott of the George W. Bush campaign. That's something that uh, we've both done successfully, is that we've set out a career path and we followed it, and hopefully we continue uh, riding that wave. As funny as it sounds to have gained an inner strength from Motley Crue, but what it has done is given people drive. We used to always say, follow your dreams, follow your heart, be true to yourself. I was trying to think if Motley Crue had to pick a political party. Personally, I think they'd be Republican because I think that they would like the opportunity to invest a little bit of their money into a vehicle that would give them a higher rate of return. Well, basically it's the last day before the election and right now what I'm doing is gathering all of our volunteers and they are helping us out with the phone bank effort, sign waving and they're showing their support for Bush Cheney. I'm not surprised to hear that Brian's a Molly Crew fan. I, uh, I liked them when I was a youngster, but I know Nader's got Pearl Jam playing with them. I, I hate Pearl Jam. You know, 24 hours to go before we know who the next leader of the free world is going to be. The stress is very high. One of those main people that are going to get me through the next 24 hours is going to be the crew on, on making sure that uh, I stay awake and stay pumped up and energized. I think I might want to listen to a Don't Go Away Mad, Just Go Away. It's the exclamation point of how I feel right now. I wish tomorrow would get here and just kind of uh, get over with.
Yeah, there it is. That should get me in the mood. Working next door to Brian is very loud. He has his music playing constantly. Oh my gosh. It's like horror around here. We've got the gal at the front desk. She goes, what is that noise? We've got Amy going, oh, Brian's in a mood. It's a, a blast in the rest of the office. If I'm listening to my own stuff, and his door pops open, his kind of takes over. I, I don't really have the power around here to uh, crank mine up above his, so. And then usually what ends up happening is, depending upon who complains and who's most irritated, I usually shut his door. Brian? He has gotten a lot better about shutting the door, but I think that that's mainly because he's been very exhausted from the Bush campaign and has been rather crabby lately and hasn't been wanting to uh, talk with us a lot. Oh, Motley Crue absolutely sums up what kind of day Brian's having. If he's having a really good day, it's loud and he's really pumped up, or if he's having an exceptionally bad day, it's going to be really loud and angry. He's pretty hip for one of those stiff political guys. Okay, less than four hours to go. Got everything packed for my trip to St. Louis. It's going to be a four-hour drive, and I'm definitely going to need some Motley Crue to get me in the proper state of mind to wake me up, and uh, I'll see you guys in St. Louis. This is Brian. Yeah, what's going on? I'm on the phone talking to all the people that I need to get a hold of or people that need to get a hold of me. That's why I wear the earpiece. I usually have one for each cell phone, but I've lost the other one. All right, well, I'll see you at night. Okay. Bye. Driving across the state, you know, a lot of times it's quiet, especially in the middle of the night when I'm not on the phone. So that's the time when I really need to, you know, wake up and, and pick myself up and kind of get energized for such a long drive. Can you say George Bush? Oh man, all, all kinds of buttons here. This is the Yokero Bush. Love you, W. Our next first family, I think that's very nice. And Barbara Bush for first mama. www.georgewbush. It's about 10.20 here, election night. Right now it's too close to call. Gore has a slight edge on the Electoral College, but we are winning with the popular vote. It's kind of a still nail-biting process, and I knew tonight was going to be a long night. I like how fast the media put Florida on Gore's side. Yeah. You had to switch it over, so we'll see. Yeah, I haven't had time to have that mildly moment tonight. Unfortunately, I've been so stressed out and, and, and so busy with my work on this campaign that I haven't really had the chance to kind of sing songs or something like that in my head, you know, go through songs that I would normally do. It's 1.35 right now. We just found out probably 10 minutes ago that uh, George W. Bush is our next president. All the tension, all the hard work, all the lack of sleep. Beautiful night. <laughs> yeah. I literally came down to Florida. I love Florida. <laughs> I'm going to go down there and personally thank each and every person I come across. The best crew song and kind of what I'm feeling right now. I don't know, kicks my heart because the last two hours have been absolute hell. And as soon as we found out, it was just such a relief. And my heart was pumping. It's a unique situation for me because I have the best of both worlds. Not only am I a huge fan of Motley Crue, but I get to play with them on stage. So it's like I'm going to the concert every night. But instead of sitting in the front row, I'm behind them 
and I'm actually playing with these guys, and I can't believe it. My parents got MTV when I was like 13 or 14 years old, and um, got cable, and one of the first videos I saw was Wild Side by Motley Crue. And I just remember Tommy Lee rolling around in the cage, and I thought, oh my God, that must be the most amazing job in the world. And that was when I said, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to play drums. I became email buddies with Nikki. Nikki emailed me at like 3 in the morning, and I got a call from a friend saying, Motley's manager just called me. You have an email. You better go check it. They want you to play for the crew. And I said, I was like sleeping. What? Some nights, you know, I'm just playing along and then I'll see all three of them just rocking out and I'm like, oh my God, it hits me. I can't believe it. I'm actually up here with them. I always remember Too Young to Fall in Love as a, I just, something about that song, whether it was the melody or whatever it was, it just always stuck in my head because I was about 13, 14 years old and I, they just kept saying, too young to fall in love, too young to fall in love. Backstage or after the show, I'll just see tons of boys and girls just being like, you know what, I didn't think you could do it, but man, you pulled through and you're kicking ass. I can't believe it. And so, you know, for crew fans to say that to me, I'm like, wow, that's cool. Not only am I a crew fan, but they're accepting me as well. Hell yeah, Sam. You rock. You're crisp, you're clean, and you're unbelievable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. This is what it's about. The future drummers of America, right here. <laughs> Molly Crew forever, man. Molly Crew. <laughs> There's fans that come to shows all the time. Motley Crew tattoos all over them. I think it's crazy. I have little fake Motley Crew tattoos on me right now. They're fake. They're just rub-ons because Nikki's bothering me that I don't have a Motley Crew tattoo. But um, I mean, people have real tattoos and like. 10 or 15 on one body. I think that's just, I mean, that's great. When you see Josh, your first impression is, oh my God, look at that freak. A lot of the older people thought he is a bad kid. Oh, I've, I've had people ask me, what's the matter with him? Like, what's up with your brother? A lot of people don't know what to think of it or don't really accept it because I don't, it's new to them. My name is Josh Coburn. I live in Brooklyn, Iowa, and I'm 19 years old. Brooklyn is a very small town. Everybody knows everybody. You know what's going on with everybody all the time. I know in my heart that I'm the biggest crew fan on the planet. This is Theater of Pain Masks from their cover of the Theater of Pain album. The first time Josh came in and wanted the Theater of Pain tattoo, I figured it was just, you know, a one-time deal. Uh, this would be the Greatest Hits album. These are the skulls from Dr. Feelgood. He came back and started getting more ink and then he expressed interest in wanting to get uh, an entire sleeve. This is a portrait of Nikki Six, just one of my favorite pictures we decided to put on. And we got the swine pig from the Generation Swine promo. He wants to cover his entire body from the neck down. Back when I was little, um, it would be 88, 89, um, Nikki Six and Tommy Lee both had extensive tattoo work on their arms. And that was the first time I really saw what tattoo was and what it could be. Tattoos are fun and they're, they're you know, exciting, but they're permanent. It's something that I think society's gonna have to learn to adapt to because it's not just Motley Crue, but it's a lifestyle in general. Getting sore, I know, I know. You're there, man, you're there. Josh handles the pain very well. Not too pleasurable at the moment. 
that I always tell people, you know, the, the pain is temporary, the pleasure is forever. God, that looks awesome. Yeah. All the gold has orange in it and, and some white on the, on the stomach scales. Looks good. Everything looks good. I'm yeah. very happy with it. Good job. Yeah, thanks, man. You bet. Thank you. I don't think anyone listens to Motley Crue as much as my brother does. I will listen to Motley Crue all times of the day. I've listened to it doing everything you can imagine. Homework, eating, driving a car, everything you can possibly imagine. Everything, huh? Uh, yeah, everything I would say. When I met Motley Crue, it was 98. Tommy had rolled out of the bus. I asked if he would pose for a picture. You know, he's like, yeah, that's cool, no problem. Vince came out, you know, did the same thing. Very easy going, very nice guy. And I was like, this is it, you know? This is like the greatest ever. Generally, everything around me is Motley Crue. This is some of my collection. It's all piled up because I don't have enough room in the place. There's everything in here from every era. This is, to me, one of the most important things. This is a guitar that I believe was used during some studio sessions by Mick Mars. This is a blue drink with like just a mixture of about everything. It's not the best tasting stuff in the world, but it does turn your mouth blue and your urine actually changes color too. There's no way that I could exist without this, you know? I mean, it's impossible. First time I ever remember seeing a picture of Motley Crue, they're all in straight jackets, and I knew there's something wrong with that picture. It was kind of, it was so different. I'd never seen anything like it. To me, it, it was the attitude. You know, these guys were real, and you could tell. At the very beginning, my mom was concerned because there's this huge poster of Nikki Six wearing a shirt that said "Suck It" in large letters, and she was going crazy when I hung it up next to my little sister's New Kids on the Block poster. Listening to Motley Crue made him a better person, in fact, because it kept him out of trouble, and he was listening to their music, buying their posters, doing his own thing. He enjoys it, and it means a lot to him, and I'm proud of him. My parents had divorced right around, I, I believe, you know, seventh, eighth grade year, junior high. My parents' divorce had probably quite a bit of impact because it turned me toward more of the rebelliousness of the kind of rock and roll thing. I felt very alone when I was at that age. You know, at the time, nobody had earrings in both ears. I obviously wasn't like these people. I think the punk rock part of Motley Crue kind of pushed that out, the kind of you, I'm, I'm gonna do this, you know? Forget everybody else. If you got a nice car, forget it. If you got these clothes, forget it, you know? It kind of, you know, I wanted to be me, so off. Shout the Devil, a lot of people associate, you know, with Satan, blah, blah, whatever. But Shout the Devil is really a song about standing up for yourself and being who you are, no matter what the authority is. If you feel, you know, in here that this is what you're going to do, you're going to do it. Well, you know, I have to take credit for sort of baiting the hook with Shout at the Devil and the whole thing with the pentagram. But it was saying, be strong and shout at the devil. Stand up to society. Stand up to the negatives in life. Seeing Nikki Six, seeing this guy who's so different, say, you know, you can be yourself. You don't have to go with everybody else. You know, at the time, it was very much a sort of therapy for me to see, you know, a role model. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I've never tried any of these. I don't do drugs. I'm very very addictive. I can't do things half-assed. I will drink endless amounts of soda. I've been up to about 23 Pepsis a day. My tattoos, my collecting, it's over the top. My mom gave me a list of groceries, so we're headed to Pick those up for a family get together that we're having this evening. I walk around knowing I'm the most heavily tattooed person in Brooklyn and I get stared at in the summer when I'm sleeveless or whatever. You know, the Motley Crew attitude just kind of radiates now because of what I look like, you know. I think he's getting pretty well known with his tattoos and everything. Everybody's been talking about it. Oh yeah, I've known Josh for years. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
I think when I first met Josh, he didn't have any tattoos. <clears throat> then after he got the first one, it's kind of like one right after another one. For me, tattoos, it's more of a projection of myself. I definitely think it makes me look better. I feel more like myself. I feel like I wasn't all there and I'm finishing myself. The two most important things to me in my life are reflected off my skin. Just like each album has, uh, you know, has been represented, or kind of each era of the crew sort of has been represented here. Um, my family is beginning to be represented over here. My family's my best friend. I mean, every one of them, if I got a problem, that's where I'm going. They all mean everything to me. I'm rocking. <laughs> <laughs> the rockin' sauce boy. We all love to get together, you know, sit around, talk, have a conversation, just enjoy ourselves, you know, be with the people we care about. You want to see the ass shot? <laughs> it was before prom and uh, I wanted to show my ass. <laughs> Family dinners are so openly and blatantly honest. Nothing is taboo in our house because no problem can be resolved if you keep it inside. Josh is always listening to Motley Crue and it's too loud for me. I don't really like it, but I went to my first concert with him, and that was Motley Crue. A lot of the CDs and stuff, the Motley Crue stuff I bought her, just so I could have something to listen to, you know, when I'm here. I got Josh the Motley Crue a little bit, because he ended up stealing some of my tapes and things and keeping those. Theater of Pain, I know what ended up missing. Shout Out to Devil ended up missing. And what did you say? You stole one of, a copy of Dr. Feelgood or something? It was a dub tape of Dr. Feelgood that I took from you. That's the only thing, and I still have that. Otherwise, I don't have anything. Cause I'd still like to know where my other two tapes went, though. I don't know. Mom, do you remember that? Yeah. Whatever. If I knew what it was, I would have never bought it. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> see? She just said I didn't she know. Bought it. She, no, no. She just said, she just you said, just said if she I would have known know. what it was, I would have never bought it. She didn't know it. anyway. Even though my tattoos were looked down upon, you know, by my mother at first, you know, my family sort of jumped on the bandwagon and got quite a few tattoos, you know, as a result of it. It's on my hip. I met two girls the other day that have been following us around for the past month. They started in uh, California. They're coming down to Florida. They've been to about 12 shows already. A lot of crew heads actually take we'll us in. will support us. They'll yeah, take home feed strangers, will feed us, and give us gas money, and Just buy us stay, tickets, yeah. and places to stay, just because they know that we are crew heads and we're following Motley Crue. It's kind of like, <laughs> like Grateful Dead or something, I guess. You know, they, they always have their there are people follow them everywhere, and it's uh, that, that's kind of how I feel too. My name is Ron Howard. My age is thirty-three. I was born and raised in water. I was born deaf. I don't believe in hard me. I'm proud to be deaf, but I am. But what's missing, um, here right here. I live with Harry Lane, but found Harry Lane, totally deaf. It's about for the state of the final law, the state of the state of what's that going on, the final marshal, and the pool, where I'm standing in the pool. Yeah, that's why I'm dressed with the best friend for that. I don't know where I am from. I'm a nation. It's not a woman for now. I love it. My first concert was on A4. I thought about the odds and I spawned them. I spawned But special guests, special guests was the Mighty Crew. That's how, 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 that's how. Adam, what shot out of the devil? Now, oh, damn, I'm cold. Yeah, I feel. I was mad at the time, death. 
most pretend and have a fun of their people, and then I'll fight myself for most of my fault or my friend's fault. My parents are, oh, money crew, money crew, that's bad crew. Do I say the like world? I don't know. That's me. I like it, man. You like it? D. Martin, you like it? No, that's you. D. Martin, you drink a lot of whiskey. Tell me about it. So, so what's the problem? My best friend, dog. And I know him since I was about two years old. Don and Don's girlfriend and my girlfriend are going to look around. What's up? That's crazy. Don't you think people? Yeah. 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 I try and the whole team tastes good, but yeah, it's strong. Don't have a bottle now. เราเฮียกันแค่เฮียกันแค่เฮียอ่ะปั๊บหลังเนี่ยพอมันจะฟังแล้วมันก็ออกมาเฮียกว่าเนี่ยเบ่งออกตัวตัวออกมันจะฟ
funny time drama. Back that's it, it's more than the boy, okay? No, but not. What's the name of the door? Okay, smoking in the boardroom. Give me the beer. Yes. I want men are the best things. It's really nice to meet you, man. Finally, talk, talk. A home, all medical talk for me. You're getting the best things. Enjoyed it? Yeah. Great. Start to make a stash. Start to finish now. No oh, man, I don't even want to hear that myth more. Sorry, Mick. Mm. Ain't got no money. Woo! You know, I've gotten lots of fan mail from people who said that our music saved their lives from whatever they might have been like drawn to drugs or alcoholism or anything like that. It's always really encouraging. Every day I, I think I'm the luckiest girl to be in that drum seat, being able to have that opportunity. For me, I feel a sort of connection with the crowd and it works, it looks really good. The crowd energy and the band energy, it sort of locks. And I kind of feel like their energy is pushing us, and then we're returning it, and it just turns into this, this, this thing. I can see it in their eyes. Sometimes somebody will even start crying, and you'll, you'll feel it. Like for a moment, you're like, wow, I, re I really connected with that person. To know that that many people love you that much and spend their last dollar to come and see you and that's that's uh, that means a lot to me just to see the looks in the fans faces of how excited they are it's just, it's a uh, it's a great feeling ultimate fan of a particular artist, send us a short video describing yourself and your fanaticism. Send tapes to Fan Submissions, VH1 Series Development, 2600 Colorado Avenue, 3rd Floor, Santa Monica, California, 90404.